All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, really happy to be here today in the 227th Governance Service Call here at MakerDAO. My name is Peyton. I go by Pros11 online, and I am one of your governance facilitators, uh, joined here today by a bunch of awesome people that both contribute and uh, are otherwise interested in the Maker Protocol. And this is our weekly call where we talk about all things uh, going on with governance and protocol risk. Uh, been here before, you've heard this speech many times, but for our newcomers and anyone uh, watching online who maybe wants to join us live next time, these do happen every Thursday at 1700 UTC. Uh, our rules are pretty simple. Uh, let's just avoid talking to each other. Cameras on if you can. Use reactions, uh, particularly that raise hand feature will let me know if you'd like to join the conversation as soon as someone else uh, wraps up what they're saying. And of course, like this is a truly open community call. We uh, really thrive off of your questions, comments, uh, and, and points of view. So we'll have a much more fun time together uh, if you are willing to, to share them with us. As usual, though, we do have a bit of an agenda to get through. We'll start with the votes and what is happening in the world of MIPS. Um, today, we'll be doing a little special edition of that MIPS update. It's a half MIPS update, half initiative update. Uh, so look forward to that in about two minutes here. And uh, we'll be tackling a, a bigger theoretical question, I guess, in our discussion topic on what exactly consensus is and uh, particularly how uh, consensus decision making could be used uh, in our current structure and future structures uh, by you and other walks of your life uh, if you find it useful. Cool. Well, I will take care of the vote section as usual was a fairly quiet week on the voting portal. Uh, we just had two weekly polls wrap up. Uh, both of those came from PE asking about resource allocation uh, to Phoenix Labs. Don't wanna get too in the weeds there, but uh, maker governance nerds will know that we do have other governance proposals concerning Phoenix Labs. Uh, this was just kind of a, a preemptive poll for uh, another team to, to assess exactly what work they needed to prepare to support uh, should maker voters uh, vote in Phoenix Labs and, and Spark Protocol. Uh, on the executive front, uh, you might have noticed the executive has passed, but it has not executed due to office hours. We're looking at taking place on Monday. Uh, when that goes through, you'll be seeing a new deployment of the Aave V2 D3M, uh, some changes from our Maker Open Market uh, Committee parameter, uh, some parameter changes to our Maker Open Market uh, Committee members. Wow, that's... Uh, a pretty big fail, uh, and and some CU MKR vesting. Uh, so that has already passed, and we are not expecting an executive next week, uh, but do look for an execution uh, available on Monday. All right. Uh, it is with great relief that I turned over the mic to one of our awesome MIP editors. I believe we have Pablo today, who is going to be walking us through uh, some slides. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't actually see Pablo or Gala in the call. All right, then maybe it's Pros who's getting to walk your slides. Let's do it. Um, as you may know, uh, super busy uh, month, month upcoming in terms of ratification polls, but we do actually have a few polls that are still live on the portal now uh, and will be there until Monday. Uh, so just going over... Uh, those, this looks like last week's slides too. That's fun. Um, cool. I'm going to take a pause here and stop sharing. So I do not give you potentially inaccurate information uh, while I regroup. Cool. Um, and then. I'm just going to share the voting portal and we'll do it the old fashioned way here together. Okay, thank you for your patience. Let's get that screen up. All right, so. Voting portal, uh, should definitely check it out if you haven't. Lots of fun features there. Uh, huge shout out to Ducks, who's 
always add in stuff for us. Um, as we mentioned, we do have several ratification polls that end on Monday. So the votes for those are going to be wrapping up shortly. Uh, please do make sure you submit them uh, before Monday if you want them to count. Um, first up, we have the uh, implement feature to refund people who lost money sending die to die contract address. Uh, that vote is currently leading in the no direction by a pretty sizable margin. Next up, we have the ratification poll to allow uh, the MIP 62 uh, changing communication responsibilities. A um, little bit of confusing title, but uh, this relates to the uh, GovCom softboarding and basically uh, the, the need to assign other responsible actors uh, in the event of uh, collateral offboarding. As you can see, we have nearly unanimous support on that one. Next, we're looking at the ratification poll for amending interim facilitator appointment process. Um, as you may recall, this was used quite recently uh, in the case of uh, CES, Collateral Engineering Services, that resulted in our interim uh, facilitator retro uh, eventually being selected. Uh, though there were a few things in the process that we learned we could maybe do better next time. Uh, so that proposal is here. Again, we see near unanimous support for it. And lastly, for ratification poll um, for the $100 million of uh, cogent bank loan participations, we are seeing a super tight vote. Uh, that one has a know your MIP call. If you're unfamiliar with the proposal at, at stake, uh, I suggest you hopping over to YouTube and taking a look at that. Uh, as you can see, currently, we are winning by about a margin of 10,000 MKR uh, on the poll to uh, onboard $100 million to cogent bank. Mm -hmm. All right, that'll do it for my impromptu coverage of the voting portal. Uh, I'll start sharing these slides again. And what we did want to highlight today were the um, budgets for the different core units that are eligible for RFC. Um, so we'll be talking about those here today. I know we have several people on the call that uh, potentially have budgets uh, that, that might be submitted for, for the March cycle. Uh, if those people want to chime in uh, after we get some slides and a brief introduction up, uh, that would be most welcome. Okay, well, this will be a fun one where everyone in the recording wonders why Peyton suddenly has so much flop sweat. Uh, <laughs> but for the rest of us, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's dive into some of the budgets that we have well, I guess all of the budgets that are potentially eligible to enter the March cycle, remember it is up to uh, the respective proposals if they want to submit their budget or not. Uh, the reason we thought we'd bring this as an initiative update today uh, on the GNR was so that we could get a chance to talk about uh, some of the proposals entering March cycle uh, that are maybe not in-game related or uh, so in-game focus perhaps is a, a better way to say it. Uh, so of the CU uh, budgets, we have uh, the TechOps die budget uh, with a start date of April 1st going one year. And there will be two options for voters to have on, uh, as you can see, the new base and new bear. Uh, this is something that a number of core units have done. Uh, as we look over to the risk budget here, uh, again, we see uh, a similar um, start date or a similar one year period, but I will note the different start date in that uh, risk will be looking to have this stream start retro retroactively uh, if this budget were to pass. Uh, and then again, you do get a selection between the current existing budget and a reduction of 10%. We have uh, another proposal from Code Knight. Uh, this one is about modifying the DECO budget uh, and includes ending the streams of MKR vesting and DAI funds on May 31st. And that is risk budget twice. <laughs> so now we'll go over to I'm guessing maybe one of those is supposed to be MKR, but maybe not. Uh, over here we have of Alpha's budget, uh, we are submitting uh, both a DAI and a MKR budget for consideration. Happy to talk more about those, uh, should anyone wish to. Uh, plenty of options on the DAI side and a uh, one option on the MKR. Likewise, on the MKR side, we do have uh, 
proposal for strategic finance, uh, who is looking to redefine their plan uh, in support of, of several new hires and, and the expanded mission. And we have a uh, budget from Sidestream Auction Services uh, to decrease their current budget. Uh, Daniel came on to the delegate office hours a little bit earlier, and we had a nice chat with the delegates. So if someone wanted to give a summary of that after this, that might be welcomed. And then uh, finally, yes, we as well um, have a modified core unit budget for data insights core unit. Uh, you'll notice their stream dates are slightly different uh, due to their original budget passing uh, before the quarterly requirement was in place. Um, and again, we see a, a existing budget proposal and a reduced budget proposal. A final reminder on your important dates uh, for ratification polls, those end this Monday. Uh, we uh, will then also have a weekly cycle ratification poll that uh, will go on chain and run for three days. And a final reminder, if you are a proposal author uh, that you have until the end of day UTC on Wednesday to update your proposals uh, for the March cycle. So we're hopefully all plenty tired of watching me struggle through that. I was hoping that some of the people who are on this call who are submitting budgets uh, might want to say a word or two about uh, how they approach the process. Um, and yeah, go from there. Yeah, I can start for the Sidestream bubble. Um, yeah, so basically we, yeah, so our history is that, yeah, we were very much focused on auctions and liquidations. And then we got the feedback by end of last year that we should maybe do something else to be more efficient or effective for, for the end game plan. So we, yeah, in the past months, based on the poor approval, we pivoted away from this. And now, yeah, we, we're having several streams that all should contribute to Endgame. Um, for instance, we started building the ecosystem API project together with SES, which is also actually the first project that we don't finance directly from the like, core unit budget, but it's like it goes in this direction of project-based funding. Um, the other things that we do right now for Endgame, for instance, um, we're exploring like creating a no-code tool for spell creation uh, at some point. So these things are rather abstract right now. So well, these are the things that we want to still finance through the DAO in the next months. Uh, and we explore def different mechanics to do so. And yeah, as of now, and as I know this will change likely soon, but as of now, the traditional budget, uh, DAI budget seems to be the way to go. And yeah, that's why we made this request um, to retain the team and um, yeah, prepare different endgame streams and whenever possible, as with this ecosystem API thing, pick up projects that are already final or budgeted, and then we just draw much less from the, from this requested budget. Um, in concrete terms, for instance, as we kind of expect for the next two or three months to just require maybe 20% of the requested budget and the rest will be coming from this project directly. And of course, as Sandgame emerges, we hope there will be more of these kind of opportunities. That's about the process and how we how we think about it. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, yeah, I feel like it's worth giving a word here. I, I know I've received several uh, messages as, as a governance facilitator with people kind of wondering how they should be approaching both on the CU side for proposing budgets and delegate side in terms of um, processing budgets. And uh, the only like wisdom I, I really have is like, that is part of the, the messiness of, of DAOs, right? You have several people trying to accomplish uh, potentially different things at, at the same time. Uh, so the best thing we can do is, is talk about as much as possible, look for solutions where they exist and uh, yeah, try to be as transparent and, and open with the deliberation process uh, so that we can learn from it and, and use those lessons in the future. I hope we'll be learning some tools and, and different ways to, to maybe achieve that uh, at the later part of the call. Um, but I did want to throw it on that note now. I know, Patrick, uh, you were primarily responsible for, for drafting our budget uh, 
which was greatly appreciated. Uh, I wonder if you wouldn't mind saying a few words basically about what we've put up and uh, kind of how, how you approach the process of proposing in, in the middle of the uh, in-game proposal cycle, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from from GovAlpha's perspective, um, we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, able to um fund ourselves through the um through the pre-game phase um of, of the in the event that end game is is approved by voters next month so um we will still be expected to be um running you know governance processes uh, posting polls posting executive votes um and as written at the moment, we we also have a role as a responsible facilitator core unit in the arbitration scope, which means that we'll be responsible for um, various roles in in the pregame phase, which includes kind of assessment of constitutional delegates and CDCs. Um, to accomplish this, we've put together um, three different budget options. Um, uh, so the base plus option was mainly, uh, well, the base option is essentially stripping back a lot of stuff from our previous budget. So it's kind of got reductions in um, the travel expenses. We're not, expect we, we, we're not expecting to need as much as was budgeted last year. We didn't use, you know, uh, much of that budget at all. So, so we've reduced that. We've reduced our gas expenses, um, again, based on learning of how much gas we need. Um, and we've also stripped out source cred um, that was budgeted previously and was accounting for about a quarter of our spend or our, our actual spend um, when when assessed, so that's enabled us to save quite a significant amount on the base amount. So it's like you know twenty eight percent saving there. Um, the base plus budget, which is a slightly higher budget, um, that includes um, GovAlpha Alpha taking over more of the roles that GovComs were previously um, performing. So basically, with our current budget, we cannot um, afford um, to to take over everything GovComs was doing, and even you know uh, the majority of what GovComs was doing. Um, so we've added in this extra budget line item here, which is essentially funding a um, one or two hires to assist with more of that work, um, kind of taking on some roles with call support, um, improving the quality of things like YouTube uploads, um, helping with moderation, various different tasks, um, all the things that were previously done by GovComs. Um, and then we also have a, a super bare option in the case that... Um, the governance doesn't want any of these things um, and they want to basically just to strip us back to the bare minimum um, functional roles. Um, that strips out even more travel expenses. It strips out the um, uh, the proposal bounties that we've been offering. So we wouldn't be offering them in the event that budget was passed, um, but it represents kind of like a 42% saving to the DAO. Um, so, we, so we wanted to give people as much options as possible. Like what do you want GovAlpha for doing? Do you want us to pick up GovCon's work? Do you not want us to pick up GovCon's work? So we try to be fair to everyone um, and try and like give you all different options for what you want to vote for. Um, with our MKR budget, um, some of you might notice this is slightly different to um, to our previous budgets, um, which were kind of retroactive budgets um, that looked at how much um, each contributor and facilitator had earned and multiplied it by the die for make a price and um, gave you a value for how much MKR each person should earn. Um, when that was voted on every six months, we got feedback that people didn't want to be voting on our MQR every six months. It was kind of governance overhead. People didn't want to do it. Um, and also in, in the event that um, the MQR price crashed, which it has done and continued to do so um, over the past few months, um, it, it led to some quite significant increases in the amount of MQR per individual. So what we've done is we have switched things around. Uh, and bear in mind, our, our, our last approved... Um, MKR budget covered the period from February 22 to August 22. So this budget applies from August 22 onwards. So we're already kind of five months in, or six months into the period that we're looking to cover here. Um, it covers a two-year period, um, which essentially will be up until Endgame launches if Endgame passes. And if not, um, then we would come back after two years rather than after six months. Um, we are voluntarily offering to increase the lock-in price from from the actual six-month rolling average. Um, so the six-month rolling average price for MKR is about 730 die per MKR. We're voluntarily offering to increase that to 1500 die per MKR to um, to, to save the DAO MKR um, and offering a cliff of 12 months. And, and the other thing we've done as a core unit, uh, so that, yeah, that should be a... That's a, a Latino uh, numerical <laughs> writing there. So, um, yeah, that's a decimal point and that's a maximum amount. So we don't actually expect to need that much MKR over the two years. Um, in the proposal itself, we've estimated 
um, how much we think we'll, we'll need in it. And it's actually less than that amount. Um, but we've also removed the repricing um, from our um, from our budget as well. So so you won't be getting a good alpha in, in a few months saying, hey, uh, we want to increase our, our MKR budget because the price has crashed. We, 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 we've removed that. And we think that's fair both to then MKR holders and to Cub Alpha. So we're so from our point of view, we're securing a, a, a plan for two years, where before we only had one for six months. But on the Dow side, we're offering you a better price per MKR and um, the certainty that there's not going to be repricing. Um, and we hope that that's deemed fair by both sides. Um, but there is still time to change this. If anyone has feedback, let us know, um, and we will we will gladly incorporate it if we think it's good advice. With the uh, end of the rundown, Patrick, uh, we do have a few other facilitators of uh, core units that could be submitting in March. Uh, anyone else on the call want to say something? Uh, yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, Rema here from the Risk Core Unit team. Uh, basically, the story with our core unit is that uh, Primoz, uh, the current facilitator, is basically uh going to stop being the facilitator and uh, we are proposing uh two new facilitators which is me and monet supply um and in in regards to the mandate we will basically be doing everything we did until now and um obviously we are supporting the end game and um you know everything which comes with it um i believe that our main occupation in the end game is going to be related to the decentralized scope and decentralized assets uh, but uh, there are also other components such as protocol owned vault and uh, some other things um, and then when it comes to the budget we are basically proposing two different options um, in regards to the die part um, the the uh, the first option is basically the budget we, which we had in the previous um, um, like uh, budget, and the uh, other option is uh, ten percent reduction. And for the maker part, we are basically proposing uh, to have the same as we did until now, which is uh, seven hundred maker tokens per year. Um, and yeah, basically, I welcome everyone to uh, comment and give feedback to the forum posts. Uh, we basically didn't get anything until now. Uh, so yeah, like looking forward if anybody has some comments or concerns and so on. I appreciate uh, hearing from Risk and yeah, definitely check out those proposals. There's a bit more meat in terms of what's happening with the proposed facilitator shuffling, but. Uh, we appreciate you letting us know what uh, what your process was. So I think I saw Code Night on the call. Um, and then, uh, yeah, today as well, I see a hand go for it today. Thanks, Blayton. <clears throat> Sorry. Hey, uh, today I'm from Data Insights. Right, camera's on, there we go. Um, so our budget in line with the other core units is to support the transition. So we, we largely are a support core unit. Uh, so our idea is to, in terms of funding to transition on demand. So as core units become ecosystem actors, we can engage with them on bilateral agreements uh, and then not have to use the the MA40 budget that we're requesting right now. Um, in terms of costs, um, the main one is the database uh, computational usage that has grown in the last period 20% month over month, which is quite excessive, um, which is kind of like a good problem to have, but we expect that to curve off. And if it doesn't, we'll find ways to reduce um, that cost. We'll hopefully not have to reduce um, support for the core units, um, but mostly be about maybe coming back to the community and asking whether a free and public API is something that uh, we deem necessary um, and we can adjust further. Um, but yeah, I will continue the same work that we've been doing and supporting uh, the community and then engage with any uh, endgame uh, related uh, initiatives that has a, a data focus on them. Not today. Um, give a last call here. There are at least a couple more uh, potential proposal authors in the call. If you'd like to say something, this is your last chance to stop on the mic. Uh, otherwise, we'll give a brief moment for any questions.
Woohoo. Uh, any questions or things we want to follow up on the topic of budgets for the March cycle? All right. Looks like we are moving on. Huge thanks to everyone uh, who helped me uh, improv through a series of cascading technical failures uh, over at Gov Alpha, but uh, better every day, right? Cool. Uh, now I'd like to take us to our discussion segment, uh, which is going to start off with me talking, but uh, hopefully end with more of you talking. Uh, so. Uh, plea to the audience to help me out there after the start to the call I've had. Um, really wanted to bring this subject together as like a kind of different way of moving forward uh, with decisions, with planning, uh, with formal organizational structures. Uh, consensus decision uh, making is kind of been tossed around in our community for a while. Uh, there's a number of reasons that uh, perhaps we'll get into later why uh, some people feel it may not be an appropriate mechanism uh, for, for dealing with something at the whole scale of the DAO, right? Uh, and I think there's uh, some very legitimate uh, criticisms there. Um, but it is a, a pretty interesting mechanism when you have a small enough group that you can actually work through uh, potential issues and find compromise. Um, so, yeah, let's dig into it. What is consensus, consensus decision making? Uh, basically, it's a way where you're not just trying to reach uh, like a, a plurality, right? Uh, if you look at our voting system today, the, the whole goal is to, to get the majority of, of voters, not even of tokens or uh, some other uh, number. It's just the majority of voters to support a particular proposal. Sometimes people call this first past the post uh, voting, uh, winner take all. There's there's a few different names depending on how exactly you want to implement it. Uh, but the basic idea is that whoever gets the most votes wins, and it really doesn't matter uh, what the implications are for for the sides that lose. Um, that's a pretty drastic uh, uh, difference to consensus decision making, where it's all about trying to agree to move forward as a group. That's essentially your goal uh, as a group. We don't want to move forward uh, until we have a reasonable degree of certainty that, that this is supported by, by, by our body. Um, so some kind of like features, some, some things that consensus making is, there's a link on the slide to Long for Wisdom's post, uh, as well as the call agenda. If you wanted to look into some of this stuff later, that consensus decision-making uh, is agreement-seeking. It's collaborative, it's cooperative, it's egalitarian, it's inclusive, and it's participatory. Um, so the quickest way to like run through that and see what those actually mean is to compare it to the current system, right? And the current system, uh, you're not so much seeking agreement as approval, and that's a, a pretty different uh, threshold. Uh, you could say that we are collaborative and cooperative, uh, certainly, but you might be able to argue that our voting system is not, right? The, the voting system is not designed to have you advance things without uh, collaboration or egalitarianism. Um, and yeah, in terms of being inclusive, being egalitarian, uh, most of these, uh, the, you can have different flavors, but they feature the idea of like one person, one vote, right? Uh, the idea that if you're present and you're contributing uh, to uh, a movement, to an organization, to whatever you want to call it, you deserve a seat at the decision-making table. Um, and that seat is based on your participation, right? If you're not showing up, you don't get a seat at the table. Um, so that's kind of the basis of what consensus decision-making is at its most broad form, uh, trying not to eliminate some of the cool flavors of it that have developed uh, in communities throughout history. So, what you kind of end up with is a lot of these systems, at least the ones that last and work well, um, have a lot of common features. Features like high approval uh, threshold, high approval threshold for proposals. Um, so that means like we talked about in plurality system where you're just looking for uh, the majority of, of people that participate in that. Um, 
it's not a hard and fast rule, but you typically see like super interiorities, like two thirds, three fourths, um, other uh, extreme requirements uh, to guarantee that consensus has actually been reached. Um, and there has been a, an attempt to, to get in uh, to the community. Um, there's often a high degree of trust or at least alignment, right? Like it's not that all your actors need to have a high degree of trust for consensus uh, systems to work out. Um, but if you don't have trust, you need to be highly aligned. And, you know, there's there's kind of a trade off there. Uh, there has to be clear rules for for what makes you part of the community, right? Since uh, being inclusive and 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 uh, having a stake is, is so important. Uh, it needs to be very clear who those people are. Uh, and you also need a really well established uh, mediation and, and compromise procedure, because a lot of times, as you can suspect, uh, the supermajority of people will not agree on all aspects of a proposal, uh, even if it's a small one like what to get for lunch. Um, and then the last uh, aspect is they do tend to be uh, governed by smaller groups. This isn't a necessity, um, but it is just kind of a practicality of like if you're trying to truly make sure that the people are, are okay and consenting to a uh, change you're making, uh, you got to check in with all of them and that creates coordination problems and, and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I've given you the rosy stuff, but like obviously there's reasons that uh, this system isn't in use absolutely everywhere, right? So some of the pitfalls you need to be aware of if you're trying to design a consensus uh, decision making a system is that uh, it's going to be a lot more time intensive, right? Like just the simple fact that you have to make sure that all people consent. Uh, if that happens at a regular basis, great. That's probably a little easier, but uh, imagine like there's a market emergency and we need to change rates. Uh, trying to get consent of, of MKR holders is, is probably not something that you want to have to do in, in that moment. Um, there's also the, uh, a stronger pressure to agree with the prevailing uh, side. And that's just because in, in our systems, right, you can vote for the losing side and the winning side wins. There's not much else to talk about, right? But in a consensus system, you don't actually move on until people start to agree. Um, so you can feel like you're blocking the group unnecessarily or uh, taking up too much space. If you do have a legitimate objection, um, you, you might feel like maybe it's not your place to, to voice it. Um, consensus mechanisms are easier to brick, right? Like it's much easier to end up in a state where you can no longer go forward uh, if you have much higher requirements for coming together. Um, and it's also often harder to explain the results, right? Like maybe you still have a vote you can point to that says, hey, enough consensus was reached. Um, but the results of your vote is like the whole history of, of how the proposal changed from the time it, it first surfaced until the time the community agrees to go, go through it. Um, yeah, that's uh, we we think of like how votes are hard to explain and, and make it right now, and like all that matters is is the outcome of of MKR. You know, we we can't actually just link someone, and and that's the whole story. Um, so that's a potential pitfall to be aware of. So, why am I trying to talk about this on the GNR? Uh, it's a fair question. Uh, broad application of this means that it can be used in a lot of different areas, right? Like. We don't have to want to find a consensus uh, decision making system that's going to work for for maker uh, on the executive level, right? In fact, I, all else being equal, would probably advise against that. Um, but what we do have is a ton of varying uh, groups within the DAO, right? Uh, there's core units, there's delegates, there's uh, maybe you're an in game and talking about clusters and sub DAOs and uh, all this stuff, regardless of your persuasion of what you want to see the DAO do, it probably involves smaller groups of people coming together to focus on things a little more. Um, obviously, <laughs> the goal of in game is breaking into smaller structures. So it seems relevant to mention to in game uh, proponents there. Uh, but it also seems relevant to opponents as well, right? When we have uh, core units that have internal decision-making processes. Uh, we have at least one proposal parameter group uh, that meets together every month uh, to recommend something. We have all sorts of ad hoc working groups and collaborations that have to spin up to keep the DAOs in operation. Um, and yeah, maybe it could form a new governance model. I, I won't set that out there either. Uh, but I do think that if you don't know about uh, consensus decision-making, like you probably should because uh, there's a good chance it, it could help you in some of your endeavors. Oh, nice. And we're getting some uh, academic research in the chat. I'd love to see it. 
Cool. Um, so I kind of have three stages of questions here. Uh, we don't have to go off of my questions and would greatly prefer if I didn't have to read my own questions out to myself. Um, but these are kind of like the levels. I'd like to start with just kind of basic comprehension and make sure that everyone who wants to participate in this discussion feels like they have a good understanding of, of what we just talked about. So questions like, do we understand the basics? Uh, can we explain the difference between a couple of these mechanisms, maybe past and present? Uh, those sort of questions I would really welcome now, like if you have any questions on uh, consensus-based decision or uh, anything I've covered here, uh, that would be helpful to know before we launch into a, a bigger uh, discussion about it. Oh, and this is really awesome seeing more research come in. I'm going to make sure we add this to the show notes for the, the YouTube. Yeah, take it away, uh, Raphael, one of our recognized uh, delegates. Oop, we might not have a mic unless sorry. it's just me. Hey, again. Sorry, yeah, no, it's me. Uh, I double muted. Um, just, just to be really sure nobody hears me. <laughs> Um, yeah, I did some research about it some time ago, and and basically, I think that you what you mentioned that you have this kind of trade off between speed of execution and and inclusion, and I think this is um, this this dichotomy is is in a way artificial. Like there is a way to actually combine them. Just voting is not the way to do it because, like you said, when you when you do a vote, then you have this this problem of like uh, wasted wasted uh, votes right like the 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 winner with 51 percent 49 percent of the votes wanted the other thing and, and all these votes are like out the window and um what i found is like i was reading a lot about holacracy at the time and i think what's really powerful about the system and what could probably be adapted is that you try to find people that are really excellent at what you try to achieve and you and this can be decided in a, in a consensual manner, and then you just leave them to run or, or you have these kind of circles that, that kind of have complete autonomy over what they do. And then they, they, they do it more or less, um, with just feedback and, and kind of like a, a emergency break button for the, for the wider governance or something for, to, 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 uh, remain safe in, in some way. But I think. What, what holacracy does and what I think is excellent is that it has these meetings where people just surface tensions. And what tensions means is everybody can pipe up and say like, this is, this is like, I don't feel this is where we should be. And you just try to give as many people as you can a voice so that you are actually very inclusive while at the same time you execute with maximum speed because these circles, um, can like have complete purview over their domain and they can just execute their decisions with without going to Paul and without um um uh, without all these these lengthy processes and, and red tape and um hundreds of meetings and so on and so forth. I don't know if this system scales well like from what I've read for instance the uh, medium.com this this online blog they used holacracy a lot and dropped it at some point in their scaling or moved uh, like they still use it in parts, but moved ahead like out out of it because it just didn't scale well enough. So I don't know if it's applicable to an organization of the scale of maker, but I think there are quite some interesting dynamics that include inclusivity and um, speed of execution. And I think this is basically what, what one should aim for. You know, thanks, Raph. Uh, always exciting when holistic voting makes uh, appearance. Uh, it's been a fun topic, a uh, little bit old now, but uh, it's in the forum if you want to necromancer it. Uh, Long, I see a hand from you uh, since I largely plagiarized what you <laughs> presented to the community. Uh, makes sense to, to give you a platform here. No, no, I was just going to, you asked the last question, like, do we understand the basics of consensus decision making? I was thinking maybe it might be useful to do sort of like, I will sort of have a sort of work, worked example of like, you know, what a sort of, you know, sort of plutocratic or sort of competitive decision making process goes versus how like a consensus decision making process goes. Um, you know, like sort of what, you know, like in practice, like what might happen differently. I know there's lots of different models of consensus, um, like decision making. So I guess just pick one that you think is, is good. 
Yeah, sure. Um, did you want to maybe lay out like the the status quo first um, as a comparison, or is that less helpful? Um, well, I think just like, I mean, the, the sort of scenario doesn't really matter too much, right? But for a sort of competitive system or like that we've sort of used in the past, like on the forum um, and on, on chain, right, we've had sort of, you know, maybe had a signal request that sort of um, asks for, for something. And to be fair, signal request is moving a little bit towards consensus. Um, but generally, we'd have sort of a vote in the signal request. Um, it would have like a number of options. Um, you know, if that sort of went well, if something got over 50%, and we'd then move the sort of same vote on chain in some form, um, which would then be voted on again in a sort of majority, um, right? So I guess like in a, you know, say it's something simple like, you know, changing the stability fee, not that we vote on that anymore, but, you know, what like what would like a consensus process for that look like, right? Maybe that's too simple of a scenario, so feel free to come up with a different one. But. No, I think that's probably perfect because there might be a lot of motivations behind changing a stability fee, right? You know, we uh, typically, at least uh, when I think about things, I tend to approach it with, with my mentality, right? Of like, oh, here's why I might want to change the stability fee, but like acknowledging that there are a lot of reasons, uh, it's a good starting point for for why this method is is important, right? Um, and and I will say in in the uh, old post I, I linked in in today's uh, thread, uh, Long does have a, a cool diagram of like a, a simple proposed uh, mechanism for for going back and forth, um, but essentially the the main difference is this idea of um you you need to um yeah three years ago is forever four years i guess um you you basically need to um kind of shift your your thinking right because in, in the current system the the setup is all about getting the thing on chain and then do you have enough votes to to pass it through um but in a consensus based system your 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 first step is just introducing the idea, right? Is trying to let the group know that this thing is coming. Uh, I think for these reasons uh, that that a change should be made, um, and I'm seeking input for for uh, if if this change is, is supported by our community. And kind of the idea is that while yes, the initial part might look awful similar to what we have today, right? It's uh, Different people chiming in, perhaps on a forum, maybe maybe in a chat thread. Uh, the the medium doesn't particularly matter, uh, but but you'd have kind of an initial flurry of, of feedback. Um, the the real difference to highlight is in today's system, it's up to the proposer to decide if, if they're ready. Like maybe they think their proposal won't pass, and, and that's the reason they want to hold it back. Um, but generally speaking, if a proposer thinks that their thing can pass, they want to get it on chain as, as quickly as possible and, and have the vote done. Uh, whereas in consensus making mechanism, after receiving the initial feedback, uh, your, your next goal is to say, okay, how can we take what we have, uh, what we have here and, and make a proposal that encompasses more points of view from our community. Um, so there's this almost reconciliation uh process before you even get to the vote that says okay how how do we make this better um and then the you still get to the point of, of having to have a vote which probably looks like very similar to to what we have today but maybe with a uh a higher super majority threshold um to to indicate to whether or not consensus has been reached um and then again uh, another big difference is in today's system uh, if a vote failed that that, that would be it right um, you know, the proposer could could go back, try to try again, and it's kind of all on their shoulders to basically rehash the entire conversation, um, perhaps at a later date when when they have more political power. Uh, whereas consensus uh, decision making, like you you have a whole nother process if if a vote fails, um, and in some cases even if it passes. So like the stability, if you vote. Right there, there might be some people who who want lower rates because they're they're users. Uh, there might be people who prefer a profitable protocol who are offering higher rates. There might be others who are uh, advocating for for more 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 market rates. Right, so you could have all these different influences that may not be congruent with each other, but may help you realize that like oh the the sentiment of the community is actually like quite broad here. Maybe. Instead, we should be proposing having uh, different offerings, like different tranches of of uh, of of stability fees for for collateralizations, kind of like we ended up uh, 
here with our, our original ETHB vault. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too long of a drone. I <laughs> departed slightly from your question, but came back to it, I think, long. Uh, I do see a hand from Kianga, so I want to turn over the mic to her. Hi there, yes, Kianga Daverington, working with Acre Invest, recognized delegate. That was um that was that was great, Peyton, because what it made me think about also is um the education process that happens in more of the consensus mode, right? And and in the time I've been active in the community since about December of 2021. My sense is there's been a shift, and I'd love to hear from more of the OGs, that there was more of this dynamic of let, you know, someone who, who's interested in proposing something eventually to go on chain, starting with a conversation, right? And that there was discussion, but that over the past, say, 14 months, it's changed quite radically where we really only see these fully baked proposals as you've described, that just want to go right to action. And then that, that, that makes the dynamic quite, people's stances are quite hardened at that point because it's a very different, there's very different stakes if something's right away entering the governance cycle. So I just wanted to throw out there for others to comment if, 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 if they perceive that there's been a, evolution in a shorter period of time away from the more like, hey, here's a idea we're working on and then there's discussion and then eventually that that person or organization puts in the proposal, which at that stage, the community has maybe more of a sense of, of buy-in. And if that's deteriorated, you know, why did that happen? And when did that take place? And what do people think about the education that's lost? Because it's quite hard to just come to a proposal that's already baked. And then we miss having that debate that happens where you can kind of inform how you would want to vote or even provide additional comments. Uh, let me see if I can summarize the ask, basically asking uh, some people who have been here for for longer, uh, perhaps maybe through a, a shift in governance uh, themselves. Um, has uh, the consensus building deteriorated at Maker? Uh, do we talk about proposals less? And yeah, uh, if so, when did you first start seeing that happen? I mean, I feel like there was always a mix of like the sort of straight to proposal things and the consensus building. Um, like it's not like it was perfect like in the past, right? And there was like no proposal straight to vote and everything was consensus building. Um, that said, like I think there probably has been less recently for like reasons I imagine everyone here is familiar with. Um, so yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, go for it, Raphael. Yeah, I think so. There was there was a tweet a couple of of, of weeks ago, I think, by Mark Andreessen, who basically said that because people say like, yeah, society is divided and so on. And he said the that's actually not the case, but just the, the marketplace of ideas is strengthening. And I think that was really powerful because um, I think coming to consensus doesn't have to be peaceful. And I think sometimes it can't be actually because human beings just have a wide variety of emotions and they all have their place. And, and I think, um, so I think like if, if, if dialogue is adversarial, that's not always a sign of deteriorating consensus. It could actually be a sign of consensus getting better, consensus building people have to care enough to 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 even um go out there and, and you know like fight or argue or, or whatever so i think of course like if you have to like just trolling like people who just you know offload negative bullshit to and and overload the channels then this is something completely else and doesn't doesn't uh, um 
do anything for consensus, but I don't really see that a lot in Maker. So I think actually that that decision making a muscle of Maker as an institution is actually pretty strong, in at least in my point of view. Jeff. I know one question I've been asking of uh, some people that have been here longer was like what their experience was when when the Maker Foundation started to decentralize. Um, um, and I've admittedly mostly been asking that out of my own curiosity because when I first started uh, was was kind of at that, that peak moment right before the foundation uh, had announced that it, it was fully dissolving. Um, so I was kind of like brand new at the time and it was just like this crazy, um, kind of like a feel good story right you know like uh in the industry a lot of people want decentralization so maker decentralizing equals good you know it feels like okay you know we're about to be a part of something um and due to my like low level of access at the at the community at that time right because i was just some guy on the forum asking questions and uh giving unsolicited opinions um I didn't have much insight into what was actually going going on outside of like uh, maybe my my comdev uh, grants experience. So it was uh, certainly very different for me. And in terms of your original question, Kianga, on on how consensus has changed over that time, um, it's a hard question to answer because one big difference was the community was so much smaller than, and it just felt like it was like. You know, every call had um, almost all the people that, that were around. If there was a new face, it was because they were there to to try to do some new work, um, which obviously is quite different than today, where we have all sorts of accounts and, and new faces and uh, kind of brand recognition to to ride on the backs of. Um, but my experience as a as a governance facilitator is basically when when really big controversial proposals happen. That is when. When your consensus has a, is at risk, right? Because uh, the system isn't tested too much when uh, the stakes are low. Uh, even if you disagree with something, if if uh, it gets voted on and the stakes aren't too high, uh, it probably doesn't change your your opinion about the organization or uh, the future prospects much. However, uh, you start introducing a, a lot of changes in people's personal feelings. Uh, whether it's political market, uh, you know, whatever lens they're they're trying to approach it with, uh, can can lead them to a very different perspective. Um, so I've I've certainly felt it get a little worse, right, in the past six months, uh, which is stressful as as a governance facilitator. Um, but at the same time, I I do wonder how much of it kind of comes with the the territory of um, people wanting to make change. Uh, that, that tends to be the time when when consensus is at its lowest and only after you really start talking and and trying to understand uh, each other's point of view can can you get closer on that so would welcome obviously uh, other people uh, Maybe even if you don't consider yourself an OG, uh, there's probably plenty of people on this call that, that might consider you one. So <laughs> if you've been around for some things, do feel free to uh, chime in. Uh, but I'm seeing like an interesting uh, chat here uh, from from uh, Ragnard. I don't know if you have a mic, but if, if you wanted to come on and, and ask that, I'm also happy to read it off from you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh Okay, cool. This is actually Sarah. I'll explain Ragnard later. <laughs> nice. But my primary question was just whether, so uh, Kianga said that loss of signals meant that there were fewer opportunities for people to basically gather what everyone thinks on a subject. So uh, my question was basically, is it a lack of a specific centralized place because being new to the maker landscape, that's what it seems like to me. So I wanted to see where everyone typically finds their information on the things that are currently being pitched so that I have a better idea of where there might be a centralized force or if people agree that it's kind of fragmented across platforms and that that might be one of the primary issues. 
might not have absorbed the first part of the question, but uh, I'll try and restate the second part, which is basically asking if uh, kind of information availability is is leading to this this feeling of, of fragmentation, right? Um, and then uh, could you expand the the rest of that? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to reread her uh, comment at the same time as I was speaking, so it didn't go too well. But primarily, I'm just wondering if uh, the ability to find consensus, like she's saying, it's hindered by a lack of opportunities to gather all of the opinions about a given MIP or proposal in general. Um, whether that's because of the fact that you have Discord, you have the forum, you have GitHub, and you have all of these different uh, places where information is stored, if that could be a primary cause of that fragmentation or lack of opportunity. Yeah, and I, I'll just I'll just chime in to give context on what I was saying in the chat with respect to signals and the idea of consensus building. Before we had the when we had the signal, you could benefit from people weighing in without there being like the consequence of the vote. So it it was it's both kind of an observation about opportun structured opportunities for feedback, which is a little bit different from the where Sarah that you're pointing to and whether or not the conversations fragmented, which I think are are different observations. Um, and I would, I would say that whether it's the, I'm not sure that it's really necessarily the centralization of the conversation, whether it's discord or the forum, but that the governance cycles and the different mechanisms for people weighing in to the extent there's more of them before the big vote in a structured way seems to me to be helpful in helping people surface comments and learn and actually learn about what they should think. There's so much that's proposed that I learn a lot just from people giving their opinions. And so to have less opportunity for people to weigh in, um, in a very prompted way that the signal requests really prompt you, um, I have found to be, you know, kind of a negative in terms of the quality of consensus building or even just making good decisions because you're benefiting from lots of people saying what they think. So I, I think I might be seeing a, a bit of a thread there, but, but uh, if I'm doing just service to either you, Sarah, Kianga, please feel free to hop on and make sure your, your, your point of view gets addressed. Um, but like the, the thread I'm seeing there is that uh, it used to be we had a formal governance process for getting this kind of like community um, approval uh, to, to go on a chain, right? Where basically, you know, regardless of where the conversation for it might take place, like there was a vote that was on the forum that was tied to the thread that everyone knew they could go to to discuss and um, would then uh, kind of lead to to the after effects. Um, that was one of the changes of the, the pregame mid setter, whatever we were calling the the first one that passed back back in October, um, where signals were were removed from process where this was no longer a legitimate process. Um, so the thread that I'm kind of seeing there is it's probably not that conversations aren't happening, right? Like it's not like one person is is able to make all these decisions. It's just now that the formal process for gathering consensus for announcing to the community that you intend to do X, Y, Z. Now that that formal process is gone, it feels like there's a lot less heads up, a lot less willingness to engage, and um kind of a lack of a central place where where people can go to participate uh in consensus making for a particular proposal even um uh you know that that's something that i think is is worth mentioning like in any in game right there's 16 different threads like if, if you're going to comment on on the entirety of, of the in-game thread like uh you know you you might have a feeling that that some of your comments may not reach the intended audience um 
whereas like the the signal me mechanism really was a way for for us to kind of collect a whole bunch of different threads or a whole bunch of different opinions put them into a proposal uh and then very clearly have conversations for that proposal take place there so like i said if i'm <laughs> doing a disservice to either of your points of view uh Please feel free to chime in, but uh, I, I, I do see a really interesting connection there um, that I maybe hadn't given enough weight to before this moment. Also seeing some conversations in the chat about, um, about the form feeling like it has less discussion. Right. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to to speak to that. I can tell you from GovAlpha, we have a very interesting perspective because um, internally, right, uh, we were in charge of managing the the source code program. It, it was in our budget, and last year we made the kind of difficult decision to, to stop supporting it. Um, and what we immediately saw was was a lot of accounts uh, stop posting entirely, right? The people who are no longer getting paid to get likes on the forum uh, aren't participating in that. Um, so initially I was like quite happy to see that, uh, but also I wonder if it has a potential knock-on effect of now there's far less motivation for uh, anyone to engage on the forum. Like if you're someone who's already being paid for the protocol, there's a good chance you feel like you have a stronger chance of politicking right uh, behind closed doors than participating in the forum. And on top of that, there's uh, no incentive for outside voices to come in and, and raise issues for you to respond to. Um, that's like a negative light in, in general. I, I, I do think we made the right call there. Um, but that is like a, a fear of mine that, that maybe we should re-examine too, which is uh did some of our soft uh soft decisions also have an effect on on the ability to find consensus i, I can maybe elaborate a bit on kianka's question in the chat there so um it's following on on the, on the source cred thread there kianka's asking um, what do we think about the impact um so there was definitely a, a kind of a subset of forum users who um stuck exclusively on the forum they didn't engage in calls they didn't engage in discord um who were con consistently um ranking at the top of the payout list for source cred every month um very often their contributions weren't particularly you know um, rigorous they weren't very well um articulated and often were just like things like oh great proposal can't wait to see it in action you know things that don't actually you know that that doesn't help discourse, you know. So you know that comment not being on a thread doesn't doesn't you know, or being on a thread doesn't it doesn't provide the the thread author with any feedback. Um, and actually, it was last week. Um, I did a quick look through a, a number of these accounts that were um, frequently ranking highly. Now that there were some pe some accounts that were ranking highly that are still active um, and uh, still contributing. Um, but a number of these accounts that we we felt were were farming source cred essentially, and some of them were getting paid hundreds of die a month. Um, a number of them haven't posted since October, and October was the last month of source cred. So there's been a very, I think, of the top ten in the last um, last source cred payout. I think six or seven of them haven't posted since October. So we've seen a very clear drop off in 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 forum activity from those particular accounts. Um, but whether we'd self-select, so one of the things we'd done as GoAlpha had been we'd, you know, um, we'd stopped source cred payments to core unit members because they were in theory, um, you know, already being paid by the DAO to do DAO work. And that, that includes, you know, discussing DAO proposals on the forum. So is there an argument that it, that kind of tipped the balance to enable these farming accounts um, a greater representation in source cred payout that's possible? Um, so is there a world where you would want to relook at source cred and you know but, but allow everyone access to it and, and that's that's a, that's a valid argument it, 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 um but it's it's also an expense you know and we're in a, we're in a situation here where core units are being offboarded you know um 
several core units in the past six months have been offboarded. And is it really, you know, we were spending 25,000 die a month on source cred at one point. So that's what, you know, 300K a year. I'm sure Stratify will correct me if my math is wrong. Um, so, you know, that, that's that's not an insignificant expense. So is that is that worthwhile um, for the DAO um, in terms of, you know, in, in enhancing participation in, and will it will it be, will the value of that participation outweigh the cost and then also the opportunity cost of not spending that 300,000 die on, you know, a, a new dev or someone else who's going to maybe provide more value for the DAO. So, so, so my view is that we did make the right call. Um, I think I was more on the side of let's scrap it than Peyton was. I think I had to persuade Peyton. I think that's probably fair to say, but um, I, I think there's, there's definitely, we do definitely have evidence that the accounts that we, we believe were farming have, have left the forum. One reflection long. long in the chat saying, I think it was better at rewarding legitimate contributions than it was at retracting legitimate contributors. Yeah. Oddly enough, uh, a great accidental example, perhaps of <laughs> some consistent, uh, consensus decision making uh, within GovAlpha, right? Because this was a, a tough choice for us, and we didn't do it based on like most of the core units thinks X, so so we're doing it. Uh, we had some workshops, we had a number of docs we revisited multiple times until we felt like you know uh, it may not have been my favorite thing to get rid of, but I fully supported the decision and like would gladly articulate it to anyone who asked, which is. Um, really kind of the goal of, of consensus mechanisms, right? Which is like, yes, this wasn't my idea to get rid of it, but uh, I think it was ultimately for the better. And I was convinced through working with my team of that process. Um, slight plug to get back, but <laughs> an, an accidental example I, I will surely take. I don't know, Longa, if, if I might try to put you on the spot and ask. Uh, you, you clearly had grand visions for for uh, maybe how, how maker governance could have evolved past uh, plurality voting. Uh, I'm just curious if your reflections have changed much in, in four years or three and a half, perhaps. Um, I mean, I still hope for the can in some way, right? Like, I think maybe less compatible with some of the scopes stuff and and game things that Rune's doing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's sort of big, the sort of, I mean, the big maybe fixable flaw of consensus decision making is that it doesn't work well with the large groups. But I think that's probably some, like, something you can alleviate with good tools and processes. Um, I'm just like, you know, developing those, I think is quite, is a bit of a task and kind of requires a lot of buy-in from everyone to sort of move in that direction, if that makes sense. Um, so I feel like there's some something of a leap of faith required there, right? Like you need to kind of commit to making or to try and make the consensus process work and sort of maybe fight through the sort of first few iterations, which aren't super efficient. Um, and I hope you can kind of land on something that works. But again, you know, I might be wrong and you, maybe you can't, can never land on something that will work well for lots of people. So. It's, I don't know, it's a tough, it's a tough one. I'd say like the, the reason I wanted to bring it up was because, um, you know, particularly it's, it's evident in, in Endgame, but I think it's also evident in a lot of legacy structures, which is like a, a common way to deal with a big problem is to, you know, delegate is to break it down into smaller groups, make it a, a small subset of groups responsibility. Um, that way, only the the bigger issues get get bubbled up to the top. Um, so that's uh, you know whether it's an in game or it's through us forming, uh, you know, smaller core units or, or what have you. Like it, it seems like there uh, seems to be some some consensus building around the idea that uh, we we can get more done and and smaller, more connected groups, um, which is where this governance model thrives. Um, yeah. <laughs>
All right, I am noting the time here and that we are running out. Um, did I have one more slide here uh, to do with documentation and, and follow up? Uh, I know one criticism we often get for, for GNR calls and kind of community calls in general um, is that it's great that we can bring the community together. We can talk about stuff, maybe even educate a, a few of us in, in an area we, we weren't as familiar with. Um, but then a lot of times the momentum just stops and that's because we, we all have roles, we all have jobs, we all have, you know, X, Y, Z that, that we have to attend to. Um, and without some sort of, uh, commitment and, and group support for producing something or for following up on, on what we discuss, uh, it's just not going to get done. Um, so kind of just wanted to pose these questions on the screen to people here today, ask folks like, hey, is there anyone who's considering uh, taking some of these principles and applying them to a small group? Um, are there places within Maker that that maybe we should be looking to do this? And is there anyone who's willing to step up and say, yeah, uh, I'll form a chat. Let's, let's get to it. Because uh, that's ultimately what you need in a DAO, right? Like until someone starts moving, uh, the, the work isn't going to get done. Hey, Peyton, um, I'd just be curious how these different mechanisms connect to other aspects of successful organizations like morale, um, trust. So it's one thing to think about what's the ultimate path to making a decision, but then I just wonder what are the, the knock-on effects or what are sort of the positive or negative externalities of different ways that people can arrive at decisions and if there's research there that we could look at. Yeah, uh, I suspect there is research. I don't have any on me at the moment, um, but I can tell you just like in terms of basic political science theory, right? Like what a lot of this stuff does. Um, it, it creates a sense of buy-in and, and a sense of importance, right? Uh, things like uh, inclusivity, one person, one vote means that uh, regardless of your background or what you feel you are particularly good at, your voice is just as strong uh, should you choose to use it as, as someone else's in the group. Um, so a lot of these mechanisms are, are really great for, for building higher trust environments um, for basically, uh, yeah, really, really aligned play. Basically, the, the, their problem is if you can't get to the point where you can make consensus, right, the whole group's just going to fall apart because uh, everything's bricked. So there is kind of like a, a potentially higher risk uh, to these situations and that they're uh, potentially less likely to to um, have longevity. I don't know why my brain couldn't <laughs> get the right uh, article in there, but uh basically because they, they need people to come together and, and continue making decisions as soon as people lose alignment or they lose the trust the the group kind of ceases to function as an organization which um you could argue right for a lot of things is, is good it means it's fulfilling its purpose and stopping once it's done uh but potentially not as good for for something like a unbiased world currency for for instance Well, while uh, calling out some of the chat for the recording uh, in hopes that someone will hear it and decide to do something about it. Uh, Long for wisdom is saying, uh, if people are interested in trying to make this work in larger groups, uh, very interested in contributing. Sounds like there's some alignment with uh, Kianga there as well. Um, we got Raphael who's talking about maybe uh, doing some uh, case study sessions uh, on, on uh, governance mechanisms. Um, so, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. It's, it, um, so theory U is a, is a system by Otto Sharma and he calls it leading from the emerging future. And I facilitated like 20 or so of these kind of case clinics. And the interesting thing about it is that it's like, it's small groups. So it's like 
four people, five people, six people max. And um, then what, what you do is it has a certain format that where somebody presents their situation and then the other people give feedback in a very interesting way. And that leads to a consensual resolution of the of the uh, situation that the, that the uh, case giver is presenting. And it's very interesting because um, the resolution comes from a very diff a very interesting place that's quite unusual and and sometimes leads to really surprising insights and it leads to a certain kind of alignment over when, when you do it over time that's uh that's not forced or agreed on it just kind of happens so it's it's a little magical but it's 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 fun and it's interesting it's, it's quite intense actually but um yeah, if, if anybody wants to do that, I, I could do that. We just have to like find three, four weeks and then everybody can present their case and I can facilitate. It's I just just some some rules. It's like 70 minutes, but I think, yeah, I'll, I'll just offer that. I'll, I'll throw up a sheet and then people can fill in their names. And if we get a large enough group, we'll do it. We can do it if we if we don't do it. I'm not mad or anything. I'm just something I, I did a couple of times. Yeah, no, I'll call that one out too. Uh, Kianga saying that she loves the idea of MakerDAO contributors doing workshops where issues are not Maker topics. Um, and yeah, uh, I will say like the global governance gathering in in uh, Amsterdam last year. That was one of the coolest things about it because we just uh, for the little small workshop got a bunch of governance nerds together and we didn't talk about our own protocol. We talked about like general problems that that needed solving and like just got a bunch of fun minds together on them um was both invigorating and uh i learned quite a bit in the process so a good call out that uh, it can both build cohesion and uh help education educate and, and help us uh with, with other things even if we're not just talking about maker problems Okay. Well, uh, sincere. Thanks for sticking with me through <laughs> Rocky first section of this call. I was really pleased with where we got to in the discussion. Um, I would like to do better though. So if you uh, are watching this, if you are here live, feel free, uh, comment on the uh, agenda thread, shoot me a DM, doesn't matter. Uh, I'd love to know how we can make these sessions a bit more easy to engage with and uh, potentially a bit more fun as well. Um, but. As usual, we'll be back the same time, same place next week. That's Thursdays at 1700 uh, UTC. Um, this is a, a great place if you're new to the maker community or uh, maybe you're a long time departed from it and you're thinking about coming back. Uh, we're always happy to have you on these calls, engage with us, see what we can teach each other. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks, folks. <laughs>